Um, mind games, leveraging behavioral economics and content strategy. My name is Amy Shropshire. Just call me Amy. I understand that's a long name. I will respond to Amy. That's perfectly fine. I am a content strategist at the FDIC. Um, here at GovCon for probably the millionth time it feels like, but this is actually my first job time here as an actual government employee. Um, I started my first GovCon was in 2015 and had been working with GovCon for quite a while, always as a contractor or independent, um, working in nonprofit space. So this is actually my first time as a Fed, thanks to people that I met here at GovCon. So this is very much a homecoming for me, so I wanted to throw that in there. Um, um, uh, so, really happy to be able to be back here and talk about this from a federal lens and looking at some of the things that I'm trying to put in place right now with what I'm doing. So, hopefully I've ad-libbed enough to let people come into the room. Um, thank you to our GovCon sponsors. I was going to steal my colleague Larry's uh, disclaimer that this does not constitute endorsement from federal employees. but. Did not get that put in in time, but it is now on the recording, so we're going to say that's official. And a little bit of introduction about myself. Again, I'm Amy. Uh, I use the pronouns she, her. I'm a content strategist at FDIC. I'm also adjunct faculty at Columbus College of Art and Design and Columbus State Community College. Um, I love teaching. I spent six years in academia. Uh, because I was tired of what was going on in the marketing industry, wanted to go back and teach everyone what I knew. Unfortunately, they don't really pay enough to live. And so I left academia, but stayed on as adjunct, so I can continue giving that knowledge to folks. My education background, and I'm only saying this to help you understand a little bit more about what I'm going to talk about today. I have an Associate of Applied Science in Media Creation and Technology, and I'm one of those people who <laughs> asks why a lot, and I wanted to know why am I designing the things that I'm designing. So then I went and got my bachelor's in advertising and marketing communications, where I again asked myself, why am I advertising all of these things? What's the point of it? So then I went and got my master's in marketing, and I'm done with school. Student loan debt is a real thing. I do not want to go back. But if I was going to go back and get my doctorate, it would be in this topic of how does psychology and the way we use our brains to think and look at things to make decisions, how does that happen? So that's why I'm excited to present to you today as much of a student of this topic as someone who's trying to teach some of it to you. I am still in the continual process of learning this, and I find it really fascinating. So hopefully I can take you on this learning journey with me. Okay, so I like an agenda. It keeps me on path. So throughout the presentation, I'm gonna bring this slide back up and we'll see where we tick through the topics as we go. I want to make sure we have a level set, so we have some definitions, so we're all speaking the same language. We're going to talk about behavioral statements, or what I like to call outcome mad libs. What are nudges, and how can you use those to get people to take the behavior you want them to take? Social proof for those, and then some resources for all of you. So if this is something that is interesting, I want to send you back with some places to start, some things to read, and other ways you can apply it to your own personal situation. So, level set, definition of behavioral economics. This is the dry part of all this. It is the empirical observation of human behavior which have demonstrated that people do not always make what neoclassical economists consider rational or optimal decision, even if they have the information and the tools available to do so. We think people act in a predictable and rational manner. I don't. 
you probably know. I have a personal example in here of where I know one of my own personal weaknesses in this is. But classical economics and classical behavior theory says when people are presented with facts and information, they will act in the right way. No. No. So as we're looking from a content strategy standpoint, we get a lot of this. We get, here are the facts. Here's the truth of something that's happening. As long as we put that information out into the world, people will act rationally, right? No. So the behavioral economics part, is saying, let's just assume up front they're not going to. Let's build this into our process so we can help shape and guide people as we want to do. Now, this is really controversial. And if you start looking into things, I saw your face there. A lot of people see this as marketing manipulation. And here's where I'm gonna go on that. Over the last five years, I had a child, my mother passed away, my father was in the hospital, I changed jobs several times, I got laid off. I didn't want to make decisions. I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to have that. I needed people to help me make those decisions. And so now I'm looking at a lot of the things I'm doing as we don't know what people have going on in their lives. And it is less about marketing manipulation as Let's make it as easy as possible for them to make a decision that is best for them. So they behavioral economics. They're not acting the way that the spreadsheets say they should act. It is not a magical formula. It is not we do X with Y, people will do Z. I did another presentation a few years ago on how this is more like the scientific method. So I want you to think experiments. I want you to think there's a hypothesis. We're going to do some tests. But it's not a magical formula. And failure is a valid outcome. Walk away with that failure is a valid outcome when you think about behavioral economics. It's not static. People change. Think about what happened during COVID. We changed as a group of consumers, as a group of users on the internet, as a group of people, we changed a lot in how we behave. So because people change, behavioral economics changes. What works once, may not work again. And what didn't work last year may work this year. It is not available without observation and experimentation. We have to watch people. We have to see what they do. And we have to try those experiments. We have to say, what would happen if we run the experiment, see what happens, fail, try again, find something that works, repeat it, keep repeating it until we notice that it's not static and people have changed and then switch what we're doing again. So then content strategy. Content strategy is the ongoing practice of planning for the creation, delivery, and governance of useful, usable, and effective content about a particular topic or set of topics. A content strategy ensures that every piece of content in an experience serves and sustains a legitimate purpose. And that's not just web. That's social. That's apps across every single platform. How do they connect together? Content strategy is not authoring and editing, although content strategists will probably be happy to pitch it in either of those. Again, it's not static. It changes. We are constantly looking at what is usable because people change. What they need in their content is going to change. And it's not one platform. It is not just your website. It is not just your social media channels. 
It is everything that fits together. So how are all those pieces fitting together? So why do we put those together? And I thought this would be a good visual to put up there because so often when I talk to folks about content strategy or what is going on there, and we say, who's our target market for this piece of content? Who's this target market for this information? I hear, where do they live? So government, we're talking a lot of US consumers, maybe it's a state, maybe it's a zip code, maybe it's federal. I hear a lot of demographics. Well, we're targeting folks 25 to 35 years old. Socioeconomic status, they make this amount of money. Well, geographics and demographics, they're easy to collect, but hard to actually make useful decisions about. <coughs> they're an easy place to start, they're a very good place to start but they don't actually tell us how to talk and connect to the people who come to our websites or come to our social media. Where I want to start seeing more of a shift in thinking is thinking about the psychographics and then the topic of today's talk, that behavioral section there. So psychographics, how do we think? What's our lifestyle? What are our activities? What are our interests? If we think strictly in demographics, we might be tempted to say Gen X and um, Gen Alpha have very little in common. But I will tell you that one of my best friends is 24, I'm 44, and she is one of my best friends. We share the same taste in music, we like the same restaurants, we go out together. Now I leave at 9 p.m. to go home and she stays out. But we have a lot more in common once we strip away those demographics and we focus on the psychographics. And we start seeing that our target market is actually bigger and more diverse than we actually thought. Then behavioral is even harder than the psychographics. But again, it's the most useful. It's harder to get that information, but it is so useful. What benefits are people looking for? How do they purchase things? How do they use things? What's their intent? What's their life cycle stage? And how engaged are they? So here's my first example. This is a personal example. And this is Bud Light Seltzer, the fall flannel collection. Yeah. This is real. <laughs> Why? Why? That is a really good question. Um, who here is looking at flavors like apple crisp, maple pear, pumpkin spice seltzer, and toasted marshmallow and saying, this sounds disgusting. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I walked by it in the store and went, ooh, I hate pumpkin spice stuff, I really do. And toasted marshmallow, I'm like, oh, this sounds so gross. And I walked by and I'm doing my shopping and about halfway through I went, it says limited edition. <laughs> That's my weakness. <laughs> you put limited edition on anything, go buy it. Whether I think it's a good idea, remember, acting in an irrational way. This was not a smart choice, and yes, it was terrible. <laughs> and it also sparked now we have salsa tasting parties occasionally where we rank which ones are the best or the worst. But another the story there. But I know about myself, my behavior is limited edition. I'm gonna get it. Because that FOMO, that fear of missing out, I'm never gonna get to try this again. I want to be able to say, it was disgusting. <laughs> <sighs> Somebody out there likes it. They have not repeated this flavor combination, by the way. Um, 
But that's a behavioral trait. So if you're trying to think to yourself, right, what is this difference between demographics and behavioral traits? This is a good example. That behavior does not match what I would tell you as a rational consumer. As a rational consumer, I'm going to say, I am not going to buy a product that does not sound good to me. When in reality, if it says limited edition, I'm going to buy it whether it's gross or not. Um, my team heard earlier I went to the Ohio State Fair. And they do special flavored doubled eggs every year. <laughs> the flavor of the year was bubble gum. Did I buy it? Absolutely. It was disgusting. <laughs> Will I buy whatever the flavor of the year is next year? Absolutely. Behavior. What are people actually doing? Even though in your surveys, even though when you ask them, they say they're not going to do it. Another example, this one's a little bit more boring. Um, I was working with a company that was doing corporate wellness programs. And we would send nurses out to their programs, and we got a lot of complaints about the wait time. We tracked the wait time that people were waiting from the time they checked in for their appointment to the time that they were being seen. And we were averaging between five minutes early for their appointment to on time for their appointment. And yet we were getting complaints that they had to wait. And none of that made sense. So we decided to run a couple of experiments to see what is the behavior that's making people think they have a longer wait. And what we actually found raised our satisfaction scores was fewer nurses. Yeah, that sounds really weird. Instead of having more nurses to serve more people faster, we had fewer nurses and therefore a less crowded waiting room. So people felt like they were waiting less time because they didn't see so many people going ahead of them. They would maybe only see one or two people going ahead of them rather than three or four or five. So now that we have some level set on what behavioral economics is, let's talk about these behavioral statements or outcome mad lips. Um, I wasn't here yesterday, but I was here Tuesday and listened to the keynote speaker. And if any of you were in here, one of the things that I was allowed that he talked about was this idea of outcomes over outputs. And I work in analytics a lot. And most people who come to me with assistance in their analytics give me access to their analytics back dashboard and say, tell me if this is successful. And you open up the analytics dashboard and you're expected to find success somewhere in the numbers. And these outcome statements, outcome mad libs, I'm going to give credit to the person that I got them from and I did link to his resources in here. His name is Matt Wallert. And he is a behavioral scientist who has worked with Microsoft, Clover Health, and now home runs his own consultancy. And likes to phrase your outcomes in this one sentence that has revolutionized the way I think about outcomes in such a simple, simple way. And I hope it works for you as well. When your target audience who has limitations? The limitations are things you cannot change for them. <coughs> One, two. What's their motivation? They will. What behavior are you trying to change as measured by data? One sentence lays everything out for me as a content strategist. It says who I'm talking to. The limitation says the things I can't change, so we might as well not talk about them. We might as well not try to convince them there's something that needs to be overcome. The motivation, now we know what we need to speak to. From that behavioral segmentation we looked at earlier, we know for me we're going to put limited edition. Somebody who wants limited edition stuff, I'm going to go in there. What's the 
behavior that you're trying to change. That's your success measure. On your website, is that they want them to download a resource? Do you want them to sign up for an email? What behavior does that page require? What behavior does that social media post require? This is every piece of content that goes out. What do you want people to do with that information? As measured by data. One data point. Not opening up a dashboard of analytics saying find success. Now that one data point may be a combination of data points, but you know from the beginning what you're tracking, what's success, is it trending up, is it trending down. And so now in the last couple years, I start all of my strategy with this piece. We're not taking it forward until we have this one sentence. And remember, it's not static. This can change as needs change. It's not set in stone. But it gives you that clear overview. It sets everyone on that project up with the same words, the same idea of success that you can all agree on, and it's something that is easy to track. So here's some examples. When health plan members who don't have any contraindications want to stay healthy, they will get a flu shot as measured by the percentage of active plan members with a flu shot claim this calendar year. And you can track the campaign's success or pivots on that statement. You've narrowly defined your target market because we just want to reach our health plan members. Anyone who is outside of that target market is not going to be somebody that you can necessarily impact their behavior. They can't get a flu shot under your plan if they're not already a member. They don't have any contraindications. So when you're pulling your data reports, you're going to take out the people that are going to skew your results. Because they can't get a flu shot because maybe they're allergic to eggs which is a contraindication for getting a flu shot. Somebody who's allergic to eggs can't get a flu shot. If you're counting them in your analytics, you have failure data points that don't need to be in there. They're going to, they want to stay healthy, so you're gonna to speak to that motivation. Don't get sick. Nobody likes getting sick, so you wanna stay healthy, go get a flu shot. As measured by percentage of active plan members with a flu shot claim this calendar year, we're putting in time constraints. We're saying they're active. So again, we're going to take out data points that don't matter to us. They're active members with a flu shot claim this calendar year. It's actually a lot less work to spend time putting this together in the beginning than opening up your analytics dashboard and saying where is success. When eligible voters who feel overwhelmed by the complexity of information want to make an informed decision in the upcoming U.S. presidential election, they will research candidate positions as measured by the percentage of eligible voters who access nonpartisan voter guides. Now you can see on this one there's probably some combining of data you might need to do. You might not know who came to your website and downloaded nonpartisan voter guides. But I was glad to hear in another presentation earlier this week that a lot of this data you can extrapolate from other data sources. We can look up and see what is the percentage of Americans who are registered voters. Is it a one-to-one -one attribution? No. But it can give you some idea of narrowing down your data to see is this the trend we want it to go? Where can we pull multiple sources of data to be able to give us that success measure? Okay. When eligible parents and caregivers who face financial or accessibility challenges want to provide healthy food and nutrition for their children, they will enroll in and utilize WIC benefits as measured by the percentage of eligible participants who sign up and regularly redeem WIC benefits. So some combinations of data there. Again, 
we might have to look at the percentage of eligible participants might have to come from another statistic source, but we can put some numbers in there to combine data points to say what is going to be our success and what is the behavior we are trying to change. And this is important because I don't think anyone got involved in government or doing some sort of mission-based work to not make a difference. And the difference is when people behave in a certain way or get the benefits that they need. So some do's and don'ts on behavioral statements. Do work backwards. Don't start planning your campaign and get to the middle of the campaign and say, huh, oh, what's our goal with this? Before you've written anything, before you've planned anything, draft some. I usually start with five or six that as I then start going through, I'm saying, oh, this one makes a lot more sense. We're going to narrow this down a bit here. So work backwards from that. Think big. I'm going to go back to Matt Waller for a second. Something that he said during one of the workshops I was in with him is, if you are successful, what does the world look like? How have you changed the world for the better? And write your behavioral statement off of that, because ultimately, you want to change the world. Again, it's not static. You can adjust it if you find that it's too big of a goal. But what would the world look like if you were successful in what you do? And third on the do's, create that North Star. Make sure your team and everyone who's working on it is at the top of your documentation. This is what we're working toward. Our decisions are being driven by, is this going to enhance or detract from what we're trying to do in this behavioral statement? Don't stare at your dashboard or metrics looking for success. If anyone here has ever done that, it's annoying. And to be quite honest, at this point in my career, I can find success in any of those numbers. We've all done it. We've all done it. Don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to do too many things at once. I guess it's one sentence. Make it a big one sentence, but don't try to be chasing 10 behavioral statements. Don't try to be chasing everything at one time. Start with one. And when you start to see that going into more of a maintenance phase, do something else. <coughs> and don't do this alone. Uh, some of the resources I have in here that I will connect you with are people who are working in this. There's a behavioral science Slack channel that you can join. And Matt Waller also offers free office hours, which is how I got connected to him. Um, and I will always offer office hours as well. All right, so now let's talk about nudges. If we've got our behavioral statement and we actually want people to do the things, we need to convince them of those things, right? And if people act irrationally, are we going to speak to them rationally? No. If you tell somebody, don't do that. Anyone else have a word? Older child or elderly father? And say, don't do that. They're going to do it right away. Yeah. So we have to get a little creative and do these nudges. And this is where it gets controversial when you hear people talking about like this is manipulation. No. Parents, you're gonna have to think everyone is a four-year-old child. And that is okay because sometimes we need that assistance. So a nudge is an intervention that gently steers individuals towards a desired reaction. I do not tell my daughter no. I'm of the mindset where you know, she's like, let's, do, let's go to Disney World tomorrow. That's a great idea. How about in three years from now? Like, there's no no there, but I'm going to steer her away from that and try to redirect her attention somewhere else. So a nudge, a home energy report that tells you how much energy you use compared to your neighbors. Not a nudge, adding a tax or financial penalty on excessive household energy use. 
asking citizens to make a plan to vote, asking when, where, and how they will get to their polling station is a nudge. Not a nudge, making voting mandatory. A nudge can be auto-enrollment in your company's retirement plan using payroll deduction. Not a nudge, a campaign for employee awareness of retirement savings options. Slight things where we are helping folks make a rational decision when otherwise they might not act rationally. Auto enrollment in your company's retirement plan. I have been so tapped out that I have not signed up for any of my company's retirement plans since 2017. I finally am. Finally am. But somebody auto enrolling me would have made a huge difference instead of getting emails constantly. Remember to enroll. Remember to enroll. Remember to enroll. This is the smart choice. Enroll. So what can we do to help make those decisions easier? Offer a limited edition seltzer. A limited edition seltzer would work wonders. <laughs> yeah. And this goes back to, I don't feel that this is manipulation because making choices is hard. And there's actually a study out there on the decision paradox, where the more decisions we have to make, one, the less likely we are to make one, and two, which is a scary one, the less likely we are to be happy with our decision. I like call this the Cheesecake Factory Effect. <laughs> the Cheesecake Factory menu, pages after pages after pages after pages, finally you're just like, oh, I'm just going to pick something. And then the person next to you gets their food and you're like, oh, I should just get that instead. Compared to a really really good restaurant. Um, the one I always use is no longer in business. It's local to call this Alana's. And every night at Alana's was a different menu because she went to the store to see what was fresh. There was always a chicken option, a fish option, and a vegetarian option. That was it. Three choices. And it was delicious. Didn't matter what you got. You weren't afraid to get something because it was always delicious. But she focused and did those three things really, really well. This study here, they set up a jam taste testing in a grocery store. And in one of the experiments, they had 24 different flavors of jam. Now, 60% of shoppers stopped, but only 3% bought the jam. When they only had six choices of jam, only 40% stopped, but 30% of the shoppers bought jam. So if you're going into your analytics dashboard to find success, you might be likely to stop and say, we attracted 60% of our shoppers. But if your behavior you were trying to change is we want people to buy jam, the second one actually worked better. And you wouldn't get to that unless you knew to dig further down into the data, or you could set up that idea of the behavior change is buying the jam up front to know where to go to find that. This is a urinal with a fly on it. So another nudge. Um, this one they found uh, reduced messy bathrooms in men's bathrooms because men saw the fly on the urinal and aimed for it and did a little bit better job. Slight nudge there, not a digital nudge, but one of my favorite ones nonetheless. We've all seen this one, our pricing, where we have three options, our low tier, our high tier and then this medium one that almost all of us pick because we don't want the basic shit, right? <laughs> but we don't want to pay the high prices. So we pick the middle one. It's often by design. 
best marketers sit there and figure out the prices. Or in one case I had, we had a special pricing tier that was off the chart called Enterprise, which was the same features as the highest price one, but priced ten thousand dollars higher. It sold numerous times. Those people who bought that enterprise tier, their behavior was not rational. They could have gotten the same stuff $10,000 lower, but one of their behavioral triggers was, we want to feel important, we want to feel enterprising. Did you work for <laughs> No, I did not work. I worked for a 17-person startup software company. We did that. Um, another example in the UK. People in arrears on their taxes were sent reminders that were worded using social normative messages. Phrases such as nine out of 10 people in your area are up to date with their tax payments. By making it seem like they were the outliers, they were up 15% compared to people who were sent letters saying your taxes in arrears and you need to pay them. Not that we need to pay our taxes. But if we think everyone around us is looking at us like, you have not paid your taxes, we're more likely to do that to fit into the social norms. And another one is saying you're entitled to. If we think about content and email then, you're entitled to this benefit. You're entitled to this thing. You just have to claim it. It's already yours. It tricks us into thinking, if we don't do it, we're missing out. It's not, hey, sign up for this new thing today. I don't want another new thing. But oh, I've already earned this, and I just have to click a couple buttons to get it? Okay. So that leads us into social proof. I think I can get through this in the next five minutes here, because this is probably the shortest piece of it. We talk about that social normative thing with the taxes, so of everyone else is doing it. So this is that next piece, is our social proof. This is called Keller's Brand Equity Model. You don't need to memorize anything on it, just know that it exists. And when we're talking about the people that we are working with and wanting to change behaviors of, it starts out easier at the bottom and harder to get to the top. And in government, I've noticed a lot of this bottom piece here, the salience piece. This is people who know about you. How many of you work on public awareness campaigns? All you're reaching is the bottom. That is the only piece. Who are you? When we're creating content strategy, when we're looking how to connect with people, when we're talking about engagement, when we're talking about influencing behavior, we are less likely to influence behavior if people just know about us. We've got to work our way up to the top of the pyramid to get people to have those behavioral changes. So the next piece up, meaning, what about you? We've got it split between performance and imagery. And here I want you to think about cars. Imagery, that's a cool car. Somebody's got a really cool car, maybe it's you. Maybe it's a neighbor, but they have a really cool car. Performance. Their car goes 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds. What are you? What is that thing that makes you you? They know about you. Now they know what you do and how you do it. The response. What about you? Judgments and feelings. Judgments. We won this award this many times. Somebody has looked at what we do and said it's valuable. We've been judged and it allowed us to be valuable and reliable. Feelings. I like working with you. That company that you go back to time and time and time again and you can't quite explain it but you like them, that's the feelings. Judgments, somebody else says you're good. Feelings, I say you're good. Then relationships, what about you and me? This is the hardest to reach, but this is where you turn your average person into your brand advocate, who will then go out and tell others how wonderful your brand is. 
And I'm going to put Larry on the spot. Uh, Larry's one of my coworkers over here. And in my first week at the FDIC, he says something I have not forgotten. Forgot. And that is, with the FDIC, what do we really want? We want people to trust that their money is safe. And we cannot convince them of that until we are working our way up and forming a relationship where they know that we can be trusted before they know their money can be trusted. If they just know about us and we say, your money's safe, that doesn't really matter. My aunt knows I work for the FDIC. She still does not have a bank account because she does not trust that her money will be there when she wants it. The brand has not built that trust. My last example, I've got Kinky Pie up here. Because when we look at that brand pyramid and the things that we can do within our content to build that trust within our brand pyramid, this was actually one of my most fun ways to do it. Um, I worked on a Kickstarter campaign and one of our most outspoken uh, brand advocates was on Reddit with the username Pinkie Pie. So we started hiding Pinkie Pie in our materials. References to Pinkie Pie, images of Pinkie Pie, just anything to suddenly give that shout out to that person. And they were our biggest brand advocate. They would speak up for us. We still to this day have no clue who this person is. But they were the first in our Kickstarter. They were sharing it everywhere. When we messed up in our Kickstarter, they were standing up for us. So if you can build up that pyramid beyond awareness and get people to trust you, you can change their behavior. All right, in our last minute, I have some resources here. The book Start at the End, How to Create, How to Build Products that Create Change by Matt Wallert. Predictably Irrational, The Hidden Forces that Shape Our Decisions by Dr. Dan Airely. This was the first book that got me interested in this concept. And then Misbehaving, The Making of Behavioral Economics by Richard Thaler, who won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Economics in behavioral economics. So it's starting to gain some traction and recognition that it's not just economics as numbers, but also how we use our brains to make decisions. Websites, a simple guide to apply behavioral science. And again, you can access these slides to get the link. The White House Blueprint for the Use of Social and Behavioral Science to Advance Evidence-Based Policymaking for All Us Government Folks. And the UK Government Communication Services Behavior Change Book. And then the last resource I want to give you is to be able to talk. This is my email. Feel free to shoot me an email. I would love to be able to talk to all of you, answer any more questions, dig deeper into any of these concepts that you found interesting, grab the slides, um, ask comments in there because I realize that we are out of time and I don't want to keep you all, but I do want to answer the questions you have in a way that I can give the answers all to everyone. So in the meantime, I really appreciate your time here and for listening to me and hopefully you can talk to us.